Um, there, uh, first of all, I'm part of Catholic Relief Services, and from now on, I'll be saying CRS. Um, the it's a twin sister to uh, Antonio's down there, uh, and like them, we work on the basis of need, not on the basis of creed or ethnicity or you know any other um, criteria you need to say. We work on the basis of need. We are the U.S. Catholic outreach in other countries. So what I'll be saying is another little piece of the pie, a slightly different one than, than we've been talking about, because I'm going to be talking about the work in other countries and how that impacts the situation here uh, that we're discussing today. And, and the tie-in is we all have a piece of what we can do in that regard. CRS has three sets of responses related to what we're talking about in this seminar. One is we address the push factors in the countries overseas. Um, and what I mean about the push factors, is, well, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, we also uh, do advocating and we talk about education for solidarity right here in the US, helping people be ready for the attitudes needed um, for appropriate response. I'm going to spend most of my time and I'm going to limit my time because of the time frame on addressing the push factors. So we're gonna go kind of a little fast here. Violence, gang recruitment, drug couriers, uh, and poverty and the lack of infrastructure that guarantees poverty are the push factors that we're talking about. You have heard some of the stories I just add in El Salvador recently there was uh, four children uh, killed by um, drug cartel leaders because they would not be couriers. Uh, two of them were blood brothers. They were dismembered and left in the streets of that town. One of the brothers, the blood brothers, was 10 years old. The other one, six years old. What are our responses to the push factors? We try to keep kids safe and fed and deliver prospects for the future through education programs in the countries that we are talking about. We are in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, as well as 97 other countries around the world. We also have programs for at-risk youth in particular. What do we do with them? Our programs include life skills and job skills training, both of those being keys for going forward. We offer psychosocial support because these kids are constantly, they're, they're not away from what's traumatizing them, they're in the midst of it while they're in our programs. They're, they have to deal with that. We uh, don't only give job skills, we work with job placement. And then we also work so that they themselves become leaders in their own communities so that they are part of offering an alternative to the crime and the violence that besets their area. We also address the poverty issue in particular by looking at ways we can address rural and urban situations of poverty through promoting livelihoods, cooperatives, infrastructure, use of technology. You'd be amazed that what a handheld device that works on icons, not words, in case the person's not literate, can do for helping them know what to do with their goods and when to sell, when to move them, et cetera. I just wanna do a, a shout out to a couple of things I've heard today so far. Um, the gang recruitment, Jonathan, uh, you described very well we're experiencing it in the countries of origin all the time. Uh, Nestor talked about Honduras being the leader in the world's homicide uh, rate. And I would add to that 90% of homicides in those countries are never solved, never addressed through legal proceedings. So that when people say they're fleeing violence, they're not kidding. Um, these are considered three of the most violent countries in the world. Outside of war zones, Syria is the only country considered more dangerous on an ongoing basis than the three countries we are talking about. Harriet mentioned UTSA's small business program. Um, the small business uh, development centers 
in, uh, did you say El Salvador? I'm sorry, where are you? Yeah, and that's great stuff. You know, it, it's, it, it makes a huge difference in what's possible. And what we're aiming for in all of these is that people don't have to leave their countries, that they aren't forced to leave, neither children nor adults. But they are, many are forced to leave, and then we have been sending them back. So we are now focusing on what happens when those folks return. We ourselves are interested in them being in our programs rather than just going back to what they fled. Uh, they may physically be back in the same area, but let's change the circumstances they're there under. And an example is that the government of El Salvador has now asked us to meet the buses, meet the planes, and get the kids into the Youth Builders program, the at-risk youth program for kids. Um, to, to get them into the programs that are solutions, part of the solutions. That leads us, though, into what we need to do, be doing here in the U.S. in order to help these programs survive and be effective. CRS and other international development and emergency relief agencies know the techniques needed. We do train personnel from those countries to run these programs, it's doable. What's needed is money to expand that capability. So we encourage advocacy from folks here. I wanna say two things about advocacy. We definitely need now to be very active. Currently, August recess is still there, and I think there'll still be plenty of time for us to, you know, Congress isn't moving really fast on this. Um, we need to do the response, uh, to, to have a response for uh, this particular humanitarian crisis. We need to protect the due process of the kids. We need to say yes to supplemental funding. The Senate's passed uh, a model for that. We need to say no to dim diminishing any of the current laws that actually do protect people and kids as well as adults. And we highly encourage the development of a regional strategy to deal with the current level of unaccompanied children. And we've talked about the regional strategy that, well, strategize, and we'd say develop a regional strategy, has come up a couple of times. And again, um, Renee talked about the Mexico leadership possible on this. This heads toward the second thing I wanted to say about advocacy. We need to develop relationships long-term with our congresspersons. This takes a long-sighted approach, but it's only through developing ongoing relationships with congresspersons that we can help develop a solid understanding of the breadth of considerations involved in emergency relief and development work in terms of migration in terms of unaccompanied children. These issues, as has been pointed out, aren't new. And we're facing them on an emergency basis, sometimes when that did not have to happen. An ongoing development of relationship that heads beyond that is important. This brings up education. Not only do we work as a, an agency overseas to develop education, we need and we're trying and we encourage education right here in the U.S. for some basics. People here in the U.S. sometimes are not paying attention to what are the basics of survival. It, I've been astounded when I've presented to audiences and I was very aware they could not have walked out that door and survived if they needed to. They didn't know even the basics of what it took. I say that's basic because if you don't understand that, you don't understand humanitarian crisis work. You don't know what these folks need. And it's way too easy to ignore their needs if you don't know them or if you've never identified with them. We need to turn that around. And this is education in classrooms, but also education through families, through social centers, through anything. This is very basic stuff. 
We also need to get smart about development work. There are ways to do development work well and ways to do it badly. One of the keys we use is you work with and through the people on the ground, the people of that country. They know their people. They know their culture. We're the outsiders, and we don't try to flip that. They are significant. They are the preponderance of significance in solving stuff. They just need the help that we can offer that they don't already have. We also need education. And in a globalized world, this should be obvious. We need to know that if anybody's mouthing off here, <laughs> if anybody's speaking up here, if anybody's trying to educate here, you're automatically on a need to know list about certain things. You need to know the story. You need to know the history. You need to know the roots of what's going on. And then you also need to have an understanding, a basic understanding, of international accords and understandings. The whole history you were pointing out of we, as a country, have been key in creating accords and understandings that now, in a situation that hits us as an emergency here in the US, we're dropping it as if we didn't know what we ourselves had written. Also, and lastly, I just want to talk about briefly about the ha habits and dynamics for solidarity that create for a healthy society, not only here, but our, our abilities also to be a healthy society within a globalized world. Respect, an awareness of the common good, that being responsive gives you a flexibility and can be done in a solid framework. And that's much better than having rigidity as your answer. Mutuality, another word for that, subsidiarity, meaning we're all in this together and we need to know we're, we're at this together. We pull the yoke forward together. And then peace building, not just patching up after a, a disaster, not just trying to push back, but building the peace and the respect and the mutuality needed all the way along. Thank you very much.